From Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I think as Christians, most of us know those verses. Of course, <laughs> this has certainly lost its meaning over time. Uh, what I'm here to talk to you about today is discerning, you know, false brethren. And when I'm talking about false brethren, I'm not even saying that they are deliberately false brethren. Uh, this passage that I have read from Matthew chapter 7, many of you are also familiar with later on. A few verses later, it says, Not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of, uh, of the Father in heaven. And you will see then that there are many who think they know Christ, that don't. And we are in an age of tremendous deceit. Now, when Jesus said this, of course, this was almost 2,000 years ago, and he's saying that few would find the way of salvation. So what do you think that means for us today? What do you think it means at the end of time? If there were few finding the way of salvation all the way back then, what about now? Do you think it's reversed? Do you think the numbers have multiplied? Uh, this is a time when the Bible says the transgressors have come to the full. And so this is one of the things that I was facing years ago. And it's like, well, it, you know, you, you meet so many. Well, they say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But they're not living for the Lord. I mean, he is not their Lord. I mean, they go to church, they may give offerings, they may be decent people, you know, but they really haven't given everything over to Christ. And I'm trying to alert people today. Uh, alert you through this video, things that you can watch out for to find if someone is really saved or if they aren't. And I want you to know that my wife and I were just in this. The Lord showed us these kinds of things for ourselves over many years. And I don't even know how he did it, you know, but slowly, gradually, as we studied his word, as we prayed, indeed, he, he set the pieces in order. So we're not just throwing stones at other people. We'd really like to help other people so that they don't fall into the snare we were in because by God's mercy, we got out of it. They may not. And so uh, one of the uh, videos I like to recommend, there's one through Living Waters called Hell's Best Kept Secret. Uh, we'll have a link to that in the description as well as uh, different scriptures and such uh, that we reference or may be referenced uh, for the topics at hand. But... This is talking about more or less like what is a true or a false conversion. Uh, the false conversion means people think they are saved, but they aren't. And we run into that a lot here in Botswana. Uh, we've run into it. No, it's not just Botswana. We saw it in, in Tanzania, in uh, Zambia. It's pretty much rampant. And that is uh, the pastors are making everyone in their congregation feel like they're saved and going to heaven. And you talk about not preaching an evangelistic message. I mean, they are really saying these kinds of things directly. Okay, everyone here is saved. Everyone's filled with the Holy Ghost. I met a man on the street the other day. Uh, he found out I was out there having a quiet time in prayer. And he said, oh, that's good. We believe in God here. And I said, well, so do the devils. And he said, well, yeah, I guess the, get, the devil is, is trying to get some people. Now, he continued walking. He had some place to go. But if that's what he thinks, he has no idea of the truth of the Bible that says there are none good, there are none righteous. Satan already has everyone. We are children of wrath, apart from the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And there he is thinking that the devil is after a few people. And the devil isn't going to be after too many people that he already has. I guarantee that. So we want to get this straight. And uh, these things I say to you, see I made some notes here. You might think, well, why do we need to go over this? I am amazed today. I am just simply amazed because it's like in, in churches amongst Christians, nobody talks about spiritual deception. There are plenty of warnings in the Bible, plenty of warnings about this, but it's like the professing body of Christ doesn't think it happens or it can't happen to them. Everybody they know is good and they're ready to go to heaven. And I really... I really suggest to you that you pray for discernment, because if you really think all things are, are well right now, then you don't know the time you're living in, and it could have eternal consequences uh, for falling away later. 
If you haven't remembered some of these things from, from Scripture, again, there are uh, verses listed in the description. You might remember teachings about false prophets, false teachers, like Matthew 24, 24 Jesus said that. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 talks about false teachers. We know in the parable of the sower that Jesus gave that there were those who found the Lord, but they stumbled at the word. They were offended by the word and they turned away. There were those that were covered by the thorns, which represented the cares of this world and the lusts of the flesh, and they were choked out. We might also remember that there were tares among the wheat. Some is like I had from another video, like Billy Graham. There are other tares among the wheat. I mean, they look really good and they will be growing together with us until uh, the final time of judgment. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. There are those with the form of godliness that have denied the power. And there are sheep and there are goats, and God will be dividing them. And so you see, there is plenty of warning, plenty of warning in the word about these things. Please take it seriously and be watching. Now, that will make a lot of people uncomfortable, because if you do this, then you say, well, you know, I don't want to be too harsh. You know, you, you know the Bible warns us about judging. Yes, I know we, we need to judge, but we should be careful. And I agree. I think we should be careful. However, However, we really need to be discerning. Uh, the first reason, of course, is for our own good, that we will not be deceived, nor will we be sponsoring those who are going the wrong way. It is we're supposed to have fellowship with believers, not with unbelief. And many of these, of course, have a form of godliness that has denied Christ. And so they look pretty good. The denial of Christ isn't because they are forthrightly saying that, but there will be things they do or actions they take which show that they are denying them. I think it's in uh, Titus 1.16. It says that, you know, they, they profess that they know God, but in works they are abominable. And so that's where we get back to, by their fruits, you shall know them. Second reason is, of course, it's for the good of the person that you're discerning this in. They may not know that they are deceived. They may be accepting things that they shouldn't. Perhaps they've been led the wrong way. They've been taught the prosperity gospel. And they keep waiting for their pile of money that isn't coming. Although I do dare to say that I think if people are serving mammon, sooner or later they will get mammon. But they can't serve God and mammon. It doesn't work. God will provide for all of your needs here in this world. So I'm just saying it could be for their good also. If you can guide them uh, directly, if you can guide them gently, however it is to point out to them, hey, this isn't what... You're, you know, is supposed to be in a Christian life like that. And of course, it is also for the good of others. If we're telling people where they should go to have fellowship, teachings they should listen to, etc., etc., we ought to be able to point out to them the difference between a false teacher, you know, and someone teaching the truth, or, good, or uh, true and false conversions among brethren. You know, we see this, and, and yes, sure, there's a lot of times we, we don't know for certain because people can be at different stages in their Christian development. But uh, it should go without saying that there are plenty of reasons why we should be studying this and uh, looking out for the good of others. Now, I just wanted to point out some of these points of concern that I look for. You know, when I'm seeing this, when I'm trying to evaluate someone's, you know, Christianity, where they are at. And it may be, like I said, it may be almost impossible to tell. If they are a very young Christian, they, they may not have gotten to that point of growth yet. However, more times than not, these things are in longtime churchgoers, people that are very comfortable with their own faith. Uh, and, and frankly, the Lord is telling us to turn away from these kind. That's what it says with the form of godliness that denies the power. When you see that, the scripture says, from such turn away. God doesn't even want us to hang around there. Again, in Matthew 15, 12, I guess it is, the disciples are saying, don't you know, Master, that the Pharisees were offended when you said these things? He said, leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. He said, leave them alone. He didn't say, go after them until you're blue in the face. He didn't say, beat your head against the wall. He said, shake the dust from your feet and move on. You see, salvation is truly of the Lord anyway. And uh, what we can see from our work may be completed. God may still be working. But probably most of the time, 
uh, it's at least probably we shouldn't think about it for anything more than it's just our time is done. Salvation is of the Lord. So it may still be possible with him, but none of our techniques are going to are going to get through. And there is scripture for that as well. Probably the single first thing that I always look for. Oh, this is this is me. How they handle the word of God. Now, this comes in a couple different ways. If it comes from like a pastor or a teacher, you know, you're listening to someone from the pulpit, from the platform. What are they saying? They're opening the Bible. What kind of verses are they turning to? What are they saying about it? You know, some of these examples, of course, I have mentioned before. But of course, I'll always remember the one where the pastor was, was actually ridiculing the Bible for calling Jesus the Lamb of God, which it does 28 times in Revelation. That's, that's the big one. Other than that, I think it says it about uh, maybe six more times in Scripture. But this is very important, you see. The Lamb of God represents Jesus' sacrifice for our sin. See, they don't want to talk about sin. And this was a very health and wealth teacher. And you say, Jesus is better than that. He shouldn't be called the Lamb of God. But the Bible said he is the Lamb of God. And I tell you, there have been a lot of people that have just been moved to tears and repented because Jesus was the sacrifice lamb for our sins. So when you're seeing preachers, uh, that is one way that they handle the word of God, or just anyone, uh, how they handle it when you say, but the word of God says this, what do they say about it? Again, even as I had told this one woman, you can't lie. Lying is a sin. Liars will be in the lake of fire. It's the ninth commandment. You mustn't lie. And she declared to me, no, I must sin. I have to sin or this won't get done. She was a Christian, a professing Christian, okay? But she declares that she must sin in contradiction, directly spitting at the word of God. That's something that's very obvious. This is not somebody who knows Christ at all. Uh, this person is not new in faith. In fact, uh, she is the wife of a pastor. So that ought to tell you something. These people don't know the Lord. Those, those things may be easy. Again, I heard the other day, I did hear a pastor say uh, how, God, how God is always changing. But the Bible says God doesn't change. So why is he saying that God is always changing? Perhaps he would like God to change so that he could get away with more. I don't know. Or excuse those who uh, he knows aren't right with God, then he doesn't have to confront them. Uh, I have no idea. But you see how they handle the word of God. Because a Christian will hear the word of God and they want to learn. They want to know what God has said. Even if it's a little rough for them at first, they will be examining their hearts. They will be looking in scripture. I talked with a young man the other day as we were sharing and, and he was questioning from the word of God. He, was, he had questions from it. And I love that. I love that because I don't want people to just take whatever I say either. It's the word of God. Straight from Acts 17, 11, the Bereans searched the scripture daily to see if these things were so. That's what we need to do. And a Christian is going to love the word. They're going to be interested in the word. They want to know more of the word. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. So there's a big difference. But what we're seeing a lot of here in Africa is there is an attitude of, I will do what I want and I will not do what I don't want which is actually part of another, uh, another part of things as far as I'm looking for here. They value tradition above the commandment of God. And what I mean by tradition is that they just do things the way they've always done them. And other, they may think, well, God loved me and accepted me the way I am, and so why should I change? But the scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. If they're holding on to their old ways, okay, and I'm not talking about how you cook supper or how you change oil in your car or anything like that, you know, but when you're holding on to ways, uh, the one that I'm thinking of by example is hearing, hearing a pastor say of his congregation, we don't argue, we don't argue with each other. But the scripture says we must rebuke each other. We have to point out sins. Jesus himself said that. We have to stand for the faith. We have to do these things. But he is correct because here in Africa, they don't argue with each other. And it's a problem because the Christians aren't standing up for the truth. 
for the word of God. And we need to do that. So in this way, they have a tradition where we're just going to try to get along with people. And this tradition trumps obedience to the word. And they cling on to that. That's kind of the thing I mean, where we're really stepping on uh, God's word. I think Mark 7, 9 is a scripture I have listed for this. You're rejecting the commandment of God to keep your own tradition. Uh, I also see here, one of the things I noticed about those who, who are really professing the Lord, they are always using men's teachings. In other words, they may say something of the Bible, but they will say, well, this teacher over here says this about the Bible. This teacher over here says that. If you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be teaching you. You don't need other people per se. Now, I don't mean we can't learn from others. You know, I hope you're learning from, by, through, from God through me today. But what I'm saying is that everything they say is reflected to what another person said. Rather than, well, I was studying the word, God pointed this out to me, you won't hear that. It won't be there. That's a very important point to make. So again, here is how they handle the word of God. And another thing is they're always using the, other, the teachings of other men. They don't know it themselves. They value tradition above all else. Another one I see is that people are talking about acceptance of Jesus rather than repentance. This is a very important distinction. Well, I accept that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, I accept that he's died for my sins. A lot of people would, would say, well, yeah, he's done that, but it doesn't mean anything inside of them. It doesn't mean that it has changed their lives, which kind of brings us to this last point, and that is what I really see in the false conversions is where the issue of repentance comes up. That's what it revolves around. Is it a true repentance or is it a false repentance? And some could say, well, you're being pretty picky there, brother. And I agree. I think there's a, a great deal of diversity. We need the spirits leading on these things. But say back in the 1800s, teacher, teachers like Finney used to say that when we're coming to Christ to give him her, our lives, we ought to spend like two or three days writing down our sins to repent of, thinking of this. Instead, I hear, hear like I heard Joel Osteen the other day saying, you, you know, for the people to repeat, oh, God, forgive all my sins. I'm going to tell you this right now. I mean, that's not repentance. And if you don't know what your sin is, you can't repent from it. One of the things you can do for a person, of course, uh, in the, like the Ray Comfort videos and Living Waters, they point out how we use the Ten Commandments to show them that they have sinned and fallen short of where God wants them to be, they will know that they're sinners. Another thing you can do, though, is say, well, what sins have you repented of? I, I repented also. I can tell you some of mine. Maybe you feel comfortable telling them some of yours that you have repented of. Ask them to tell you what sins they have repented of. And if they're having trouble telling you, or you can tell that it's, it's, it, it's kind of strange to them, they haven't repented. You see, sometimes I hear this within churches, uh, the person up front is leading in like a general prayer, you know, and just be like, oh, God, forgive all my sins or, oh, God, forgive me if I have sinned against you. That is a phony prayer. OK, I don't mean <laughs> you say, well, I really mean it. Well, if you really mean it, then you know what you're repenting of. What did you do? The Bible does not condemn us for sins done in ignorance. This is straight from, I think it's like uh, John 9, 41. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. In the Old Testament, again, they address sins done in ignorance. We are not accountable for those sins until God points them out to us. And so it is futile to just say, oh, forgive all my sins. It's like you're, you know, you're crossing your fingers. Oh, oh, I sure hope God forgives me. I sure hope I didn't do anything wrong. He might come in the next five minutes and, and I won't go. Well, we also know the any moment rapture isn't true, but the problem is that it's not a genuine repentance, okay? These, person, these people have probably never thought that they really needed repentance. They need to know that they are separated from God by their sins, that there is no good in them. If they have ever been led in some type of sinner's prayer, it is usually uh, the most superficial type. 
But there are those that come, and, and sometimes when a person has made a mess of their lives, they have fallen into a lot of sin. Things like alcohol, drugs, violence, uh, broken homes, things like this. And these are terrible, and they may lead to a genuine repentance. But only too many times the repentance is not genuine from the start. I have an example of this to read from Scripture. This is from Psalm 78. It starts with, I'm going to start with verse 34. When he slew them, that is God slaying the Israelites, his people, when he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. There are some that are out there, I mean, they come to kind of this emotional point of change in their life. They know they need to make a change. They know things need to be different. And the truth is they would latch on to just about anything. Uh, one time I saw, I mean, I read the testimony of a man. Uh, this is actually William Schnublin. Uh, he has this in his book, Lucifer Dethroned. You can get that through uh, chick.com. Uh, he actually said that like when he first turned away, he was a Satanist. He was a vampire. He was into some serious stuff. When he first turned from this extreme, he turned to Mormonism. Okay. And Mormonism was very much in line with a lot of things he was doing as a Satanist. And they told him so. Uh, so he didn't make a full conversion at that time. He did come into a full conversion later. And so I'm just saying we ought to watch out for this uh, true and false conversion. A lot of times this revolves around the issue of repentance. We need to see where a person's affections are. I think as I had suggested in another video the other day, uh, when one person, he found out, you know, God had led us here and everything. He, he started saying things, how much he loved God. And he goes to church all the time. And, and I can't, in a way, I can't evaluate for sure you know, what's going on, but he kept saying how much he loved his life here, and he's always thanking God for being alive today, and this and that, and I said, well, would you thank God if you were dying? He didn't have anything to say about that, and this is just something I see generally in professing Christians today. They're really just loving their lives here on this earth, and they're not ready to go home and be with the Lord. Jesus said in, in John 12, 25, that we are to hate our lives in this world. We need to know that you know, going home to be with the Lord is much better. As we really, uh, read in Philippians 1, it's much better. That's what we would want to do. We'd want to be away from all this pain and misery and sin and evil. But the people are so entrenched in the world. These are, these are professing Christians. They're so entrenched in the world, they can't leave it. So please take me seriously when I say that there are real and false conversions. The Lord tells us to examine ourselves uh, as well as others. And yes, Please always self-examine before looking too seriously uh, towards someone else. But you will see, your witness of the Spirit will be, you know, there is something wrong here. And uh, God has said it would be so in these last days. And we want to be armed to the teeth with all the spiritual armor that uh, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will give to us. May God bless this message uh, to your edification.